Hi, everybody. This is Josh Nelson from Keystone Financial. Just checking in with everybody to make sure that they can see my stuff. Um, we should have slides on the screen. And we have a couple of different features on here that will allow you to chat with me or ask questions along the way. So feel free to use those features. There's a couple of things, uh, chat and questions, and I've got both of those windows up in front of me. So I'm happy to answer anything along the way. And uh, certainly at the end, we'll answer questions as well, but it's more fun if this is interactive. So please feel free to ask questions and use the chat feature if you've got comments or other things, uh, smart aleck remarks, <laughs> whatever that might be as I'm going, it definitely makes it more fun for everybody. So uh, we'll get started here in just a couple minutes. All right, I can see a few more people joining and we will get started right at 11 a.m. Mountain Time. But again, I do want to emphasize that we've got two windows. Um, you can locate those in the GoToWebinar toolbar and those will be chat and questions. So please feel free to use those. Also got a handouts area in there as well. I've included something that uh, some of you may have already received before, but it's our key financial data for 2018 extremely helpful piece that we have consolidated pretty much every piece of financial limits, uh, tax bracket, things like that all into one document. So feel free to grab that out of the handouts, my gift to you as you do your planning for 2018. And got about one more minute to go and then we'll get started with the actual presentation itself. Okay, well, I'm going to turn on my webcam here for a moment. And all right, there you are. Um, glad to see everybody today. Today's a beautiful day here in Colorado, and we're going to be talking about women and wealth. And there's some big, big shifts that's happened there in the last few decades that, uh, you know, we've seen as a society, but also that I've seen as a financial advisor doing this almost 20 years. I've seen some of those shifts as well, and that more and more women are taking control of their financial future, their financial decisions and understanding a lot more. I'd say, you know, before I was born, obviously, but 50, 60 years ago, things were much more uh, traditional or whatever word you may want to use for that. But it used to be that the finances were all controlled by the male and the male is primarily the one earning the money. So that has shifted dramatically. And we'll be talking about that uh, as well as longevity and the fact that sooner or later, whether it happens now, it happens down the road. Typically, women are the ones that end up controlling the wealth, even if they weren't at the beginning. So we're going to go through and talk about some misconceptions that some people have, some stats, and also some strategies that women should be looking at. And that being said, you may not be a woman. You know, If you're attending this, you may be a man, and uh, it could be that you're trying to get information and to try to pull together some information or knowledge for somebody that's in your life, like a parent or a spouse or something that you'd like to get more involved in their finances. So this is open for everybody, but specifically geared towards women and why there are some unique planning things that need to be taken into account when it comes to women and money. So I'm going to turn off my webcam for right now and turn it on later on, but make sure you're using the questions feature and also be using the chat feature if you've got stuff that you want me to cover along the way. So when I got into this industry in 1999, I can tell you that even at that point that the shift was happening, I was seeing a lot more uh, more and more as I was doing meetings with people. And gosh, over 20 years, I've done literally thousands of financial consultation meetings with people, as well as seminars, done a lot of group presentations. And I can tell you that more and more that things are equalizing. In fact, I'd say more often than not, it's the female in a relationship, uh, the wife you know, in a relationship that oftentimes is making sure that more questions are being asked, sometimes more difficult topics are being addressed, and also 
uh, one thing that I've emphasized as an advisor is making sure that both people are in the meeting, especially the, the initial meeting, that both people are there and that both people are involved in the planning, even if it's something that shifts over time. So one thing that I'll, uh, I'll go through is that uh, obviously everything that we talk about today is educational, obviously not giving any specific advice to anybody who's attending, but I do encourage people to reach out to us individually if you'd like to talk about your individual situation and how it would apply to you. So the great shift of wealth to women, I would argue that this is not something that's new. This is something that's actually been going on for quite some time. And uh, sooner or later, because of longevity, if nothing else, typically women are the ones that end up controlling the money or end up making decisions on the money. So 43% of the top wealth is held by women at this point, and that number is continuing to go up over time. Women are estimated to receive 70% of the $41 trillion in the intergenerational wealth transfers over the next several decades. Why is the number so big? Why is that shift so large? It's because of the baby boom. We have 10,000 people a day right now that are turning age 65. And over the next several decades, those people are going to start to pass away and start to pass on wealth. And women, because of longevity, if, again, if nothing else, will end up controlling most of that wealth as time goes on. Also, uh, inter intergenerational wealth, meaning that that's getting passed on, not just from spouses, but also from their parents. As we're seeing that more and more in client meetings that we're talking about people's parents and they might be, the client might be in their 50s, 60s or 70s even, and they're really dealing with their parents as their health might be declining or they might be in a position where they're making some major financial decisions about their future. So 95% of women are financial decision makers. Really, we'd like to see that number 100%, whether you're married or not. Uh, again, it used to be that we would find that it used to be a very male-dominated uh, decision as far as who handled the money. Now, I, I see that's shifted dramatically. And the most healthy thing, of course, is that both spouses are involved in decision-making and both of them are involved in the creation of the wealth, the preservation of the wealth, the financial decisions that lead to people's financial success. And 84% of married women are either solely or jointly responsible for the household finances. Again, it used to be that during my early years in the late 90s, early 2000s, I'd find that it was still at that point, maybe even a more dominated discussion would be on the male. Not so much now. In a lot of cases, I still find that one spouse or the other will tend to be more involved in the finances. But more and more, I'm seeing that that's actually the the woman in the relationship, the wife in the relationship that ends up taking more of the lead with regard to planning. So it's still, I would say, again, I emphasize that it's important that both people are involved as much as possible, that there's a lot of transparency and that everybody knows where the money is and also is involved in the decisions. So what's happening overall, you know, there's population growth. Um, certainly, men are becoming a smaller portion of the overall employment pool. Again, that's a trend that's been going on for decades now. That's not anything new. But now that we're seeing, um, we're, we're seeing that it's less and less likely that the that that one of the two people is not going to be having a career. Most of the time you're seeing both of them will end up having a career. Uh, women have surpassed men in earning college degrees and doctorates, and also women are earning more than ever before. So that's a, a big shift that might be surprising people. There still are some inequalities, certainly, but that shift is happening dramatically. Uh, women are also earning more than their husbands at an increasing rate. I'm seeing that, again, uh, most of my clients are from the high-tech world, and I'm seeing that happen in client meetings. I'm seeing the information. I'm seeing the, the salaries. And more and more, I'm seeing that the, the woman is earning more than their husband. Uh, women are starting businesses at twice the rate of men, which is great and more likely to be a single than a generation ago. So factors to consider. Overall, what sets women apart is that there's still a discrepancy in pay. And I know there's been a lot of debate on this in, uh, you know, politically, there's a lot of debate on it and, and a lot of discussion in corporate America as far as eliminating that discrepancy. But one of the reasons for that, that they found in doing research is that st 
still there's a tendency for the woman to stay home for a period of time after babies are born. And what that does is it actually can set them back, even if they were in the same pay grade and same um, uh, same career trajectory, that could slow them down. And so being out, especially if it's a number of years, that could end up resulting in less pay. That's a, a big reason that we're seeing. Uh, hopefully, there's not outright discrimination where uh, you know it's it's something purposeful. I think most of the discussion right now is in good faith um, in corporations, and, and hopefully that it will end up getting more and more eliminated. However, though, because of women, a lot of cases not being in the workforce for a number of years in their relationship, they might not have as high of earnings to be paying into Social Security. So 26% of people who receive Social Security on it and, and women that rely on it for 90% or more of their family income. I believe that. I believe it simply because if we look at the overall population, about 30% of the population, this is men and women, but 30% of the population that's retired has nothing. They have no assets, no no equity, no investments. So they're just living off of Social Security. And then in the long run, um, typically, if the woman is living longer, she's going to end up receiving the Social Security benefits off of her spouse, which could be a higher amount. And in many cases, that does result in the majority of their income coming from Social Security. So that's really critical because, uh, you know, more and more, I think one danger is that a lot of times people are disregarding Social Security because there's been so much talk out there about it going away, about it becoming insolvent at some point. And more and more, especially with younger people, I'm finding that they don't even want to talk about it. They're not even considering it in retirement planning, from a retirement planning standpoint. But I think it's pretty unlikely that Social Security is just going to completely go away. And the reason why is because why it was started in the first place back in the 30s is that during the Depression, you literally had people that were in their old age starving to death and homeless because they had no safety net. And so Social Security was started to remedy that, and that's still going to be a need down the road. That's not going to change. And as a society, I just can't imagine that we're going to go to the place that we're not going to support our elderly people. Um, you know, we'll take out of the discussion people's choices and so forth, because maybe people just didn't do a good enough job saving. But regardless, as a society, we're not likely to get to that point. That being said, though, what is likely to happen, because essentially we didn't have enough kids born in the 70s and 80s, and so you've got a, a population shift, and the way Social Security was designed originally was that current workers are actually paying for uh, recipients, for people who are currently uh, drawing benefits. And if you have lots and lots of people retiring, like right now, the baby boom um, has 10,000 people a day retiring. They're leaving the workforce. They're no longer paying Social Security taxes into the system. And there just aren't enough people in that couple decade period of time, in the 70s and 80s. It's resulted in a smaller number of workers and not enough payroll taxes being paid to pay out benefits. That being said, what that means is that there's likely to be a shift down the road in that some combination will need to happen between making people wait longer to start collecting benefits. Their benefits might be taxed more heavily. They might increase payroll taxes for current workers. There's likely to be some major shifts in the program and how it's designed, even to the point where it may be phased out for certain people if you're over certain income levels, which is really important as far as how we plan then, right? As far as making sure that we stay under those income levels. In other words, as a financial planner, I'd be sitting down with my clients and making sure let's figure out how we can generate you income so you don't end up losing a lot of social security benefits. So I harp on that uh, simply because a lot of people are just disregarding social security planning. It's critical because you can leave a lot of money on the table if you don't collect in the right way. In other words, you don't want to leave money on the table that would allow you to draw off of your own benefits or spousal benefits that could result in an increase in the future. You want to make your decisions with eyes wide open. And then women tend to live longer than men. Uh, women age 81, men 76. That's overall life expectancy. So keep in mind, because you probably can think of a lot of people that are much older than that, but you also have to keep into account that's looking at somebody's entire life expectancy and that there were people that passed away really early on in life. So um, every year you live longer, the higher life expectancy you've got, 
And I would plan on, from a retirement standpoint, when I put in client numbers into the life expectancies, I plug it out into age 95, even 100 in a lot of circumstances, because with medical advancements we're seeing right now, people are likely to live much, much longer in the future and with a higher quality of life. So common myths. You need to have a lot of money to invest. Uh, not true. The best example I've ever seen of this, I can't remember the guy's name, but he was a UPS employee many, many years ago that participated in the stock purchase plan. I think his his salary was literally less than $20,000 for most of his career, but the guy ended up retiring and having millions and millions of dollars simply because he had participated in the stock purchase plan at work. So even with a trickle of money over time, that can end up being quite a bit of money that gets accumulated over time. The key is to start early, not to have a lot of money or have a very high income. Uh, if a spouse has a pension plan that a woman is set for the duration of her life, well, clearly not true, nor would it the opposite be the case. So pensions largely are going away. It's very rare, in other words, that people would even have a pension now. If you do, it's probably because you work for the government. You've got some kind of a, a government job like a teacher or a state employee that has access to, in Colorado, called PARA, but many other states, access to public pension programs. Uh, men and women have the same investment goals, age and stage of life are the only factors uh, not true. I'd say some some interesting factors with women we're covering in the presentation, but oftentimes um, they have very different goals. And in a lot of cases, they might make very different decisions with their money. Um, so there's a lot of things that we could get into there as far as kind of tendencies and how people make investment decisions. Um, for one that I read recently is that men tend to get higher rates of return on their investments over time than women because they tend to be more risk takers. They tend to, to go out on the risk scale some because they tend to be more risk takers versus women tend to be more conservative. Uh, so one thing to keep in mind, again, it's a generalization, but one thing to keep in mind and one advantage of having somebody, having an advisor or somebody you're working with, because whether you're a man or a woman, they can help kind of temper those things on either end of the spectrum where somebody's taking on way too much risk or way too little risk to be able to reach their goals. And then Social Security will be sufficient for retirement income. Well, maybe. I mean, it, it's not going to allow you to do a whole lot. I, I can tell you from working with a lot of people over the years, uh, Social Security, again, it was designed to keep people from starving to death, but not a lot more. You probably won't be doing a lot of travel or gifting to your kids or participating in expensive activities like golf or skiing or something like that. So, uh, you know, one thing to keep in mind is that Social Security really was never designed to do much more beyond to make sure that people were fed and had their housing paid for. And here in Colorado, it's gotten so expensive to live here that in a lot of cases, people really could be in a tough position housing wise because things are so expensive to be able to maintain a standard of living just on Social Security, even if their house was paid off. And then finally, if you have a pension, you don't need to save. Uh, not true. Certainly, most companies don't offer pensions anymore. Even if you qualify for a government pension like PERA or in California, if you're part of CalPERS or many other states that offer similar programs, you still need to save because those pension plans are not guaranteed, first of all. You may think they are, but they can get changed, and we can talk about a lot of examples of states and local governments that have made changes to their programs even after people were retired, but also that they may be guaranteed for one person's life, but depending on the, your collection strategy and what option you chose, it may not be paying out anything for the second spouse's life, say if the first spouse passed away early. And in a lot of cases, it does not pay out 100% regardless. It may pay out 50% of benefits and if both spouses were relying on that income for their entire life, really important to think about not only are we okay together, but would we be okay separate? If one spouse or the other passed away, would we still be okay at that point? So setting financial goals, um, really important for everybody, of course, but for women, um, oftentimes I've found that they may not have thought through it completely, 
where they may be kind of defaulting to what their spouse might have told us, for example, as financial advisors. So very important when you're thinking about setting goals, you do need to be specific. Um, Short-term goals typically would be things like figuring out the budget and figuring out where money is going right now and just getting clarity on on where is the money getting spent. In a lot of cases, if people are confused about where all the money is going each month and why they don't have extra, it may result in them having to do a detailed budget exercise, which thankfully, now we have lots of technology tools to help us do that. You could use things like Quicken or Mint.com or many other free tools are out there. We also have budgeting tools for our clients that are included with our wealth management site that you can use to do that as well. But gain clarity on where the money is going and reducing anything that's not really necessary. If it's something that's not really making you happier or increasing your quality of life, chances are we've all got some stuff that we can cut back on that we really wouldn't miss all that much. For example, there's a lot of people right now that are cutting the cord and getting rid of traditional satellite or cable television, which can be pretty darn expensive depending on what package you're on, and just sticking with their internet and using Netflix or Hulu or other services that would allow them to watch programs that they probably would have paid a lot more for to watch under satellite or cable. So obviously everybody's got their own budget, their own uh, spending things and uh, you know items that they like to spend their money on. We all have our own stuff, in other words, that we spend that money on. If we're looking to cut back, um, certainly gain that clarity is important. Determining savings priorities, really for shorter term stuff, if we've got upcoming expenses like home improvements or vehicles, or maybe helping kids out, important to think about what that will be and what the timing will be. Things that would commonly fall into that category that catch people off guard are home improvement projects. Uh, For example, really thinking about in advance, thinking about what are the things in our house, appliances or windows or roofs, things like that, that are starting to age. So starting to plan that stuff in advance will allow you to accumulate the funds and not be caught off guard and have a, a huge expense come at one time when you weren't planning for it. Uh, certainly an emergency fund, good rule of thumb is an emergency fund uh, can start very small. I'd say if you have nothing right now in cash savings or checking, think about just accumulating a thousand bucks. Think, accumulate a very small amount of money, but at least it's some safety net and then build up to an initial goal of three months worth of living expenses. So that would be a range for a, a first stab at it. And certainly, depending on your situation, your comfort level, you might want to go more months, more months of living expenses. And if you've done that budget exercise, now you'll know, right? You'll know what your monthly run rate is, so you can determine how much you need to keep in a cash reserve. Uh, Start or increase savings for a goal um, and check tax withholding. Sometimes we're seeing that people are withholding way too much taxes or way too little taxes, and that can cause problems on either end, either where that's money that they could have been using for other stuff like paying down debt, but they end up getting some huge refund at tax time every year. That's not very efficient, and it's also not good from a behavioral standpoint, too, because then we're always kind of expecting this windfall that can bail us out, right, if if we need to pay off credit cards or things like that. So make sure you're not withholding too much taxes, but make sure you're not under withholding either, because it's equally not as fun, probably even less fun, to end up with a huge payment that you have to make at tax time to uh, pay the IRS or your state government for what should have been paid in before. So that's really important to to make sure that taxes are managed well and that you stick as close as possible. It's always good to get a little refund just so there's not a big check you have to write, but having a big refund doesn't make a lot of sense. It's basically just giving the government an interest-free loan, which I'm sure they very much appreciate, right? But uh, not very good from a financial planning standpoint. Long-term goals, uh, paying off debt. And my favorite way for paying off debt is using the debt snowball approach, which is not mine, that's Dave Ramsey's, but using the debt snowball approach, what that means is that you make a list, doesn't need to be on a spreadsheet, just a list them out on a piece of paper, make a list of each debt and its balance. We don't care about what the interest rate is, we don't even care about what the payment is that's required each month right now, just a list of the name of the debt and the balance, and we would make that list in order of the balance from lowest to highest. So make a list at the top, smallest debt down to the bottom. 
what the goal is here is that we're going to get a snowball effect by putting all of our energy, all of our extra money into paying down that smallest debt first. So at the top of the list, let's say we had a $500 uh, balance on a Kohl's card. And then the second balance was on a credit card at $2,000. And now we've got the third loan as a student loan. The fourth, fourth is a car and the fifth is a mortgage. What we would be doing is making the minimum payment on every single debt except for the smallest one. So every penny that we weren't putting onto a required payment, the minimum payment on everything else, we would be pouring into paying that smallest debt first. And lo and behold, if we were very, very focused, it probably is not going to take very long to pay off that $500 Kohl's card. And now, let's say if the monthly minimum payment on the Kohl's card was $50, what have we done? Now we've freed up some cash flow, right? Because now our minimum monthly payments are lower by not having to make the $50 payment. Now we can take the $50 payment on top of everything else that we could come up with to put down on the next one, the credit card and then the student loans and the cars and then eventually the mortgage to become debt free in the long run. So paying off debts, that's uh, the debt snowball is my favorite way of doing that because it's a way to stay very focused and not get scattered into trying to pay everything off all at once and try to uh, you know fight a dozen battles. It, it just doesn't work very well versus staying very focused. Uh, long-term goals also could be paying for kids stuff. It could be helping kids pay for college. It could be helping to pay for a wedding. It could be helping pay for grandkids college in the long run. Uh, retirement, protecting the assets, all these goals are important. These are the common goals that people have. That doesn't mean that this is your goal. This means that it's the ones that we hear the most as financial planners we hear people talk about. I recommend that you really get some clarity on what each one of these might mean to you. So instead of just using the word retirement, which we did here for sake of space, I really like to dig into that conversation more with clients and talk about what that means to them and what kind of life that they want to have in retirement. And in a lot of cases, retirement doesn't actually mean to them, it may not even mean stopping work. In some cases, they love their work. Look at Warren Buffett. He's in his late 80s now, and he still goes to work every day. And the guy's one of the richest people in the world. And so uh, certainly he's been financially independent for probably most of his career. He could have retired and lived comfortably, especially on his lifestyle, because he drives an old pickup and lives in the same house he's lived in for decades in Omaha. But in his case, really, he goes to work because he wants to, uh, but he's got the ability. He knows he's financially independent. He knows that he can do the things that he wants to do, be able to help the organizations he wants to help. But he's gotten clarity, certainly, in, in really what that means to him and where he wants to direct his money. Establishing a legacy, that's another one. Uh, thinking about, is that important, to be leaving money to somebody at the end? In some cases, we find out that it's not, that, it, that they really don't have a goal to leave a bunch of money to kids or other family members. But what they do say, though, in many cases, is they want to help the kids out while they're still living. And they might want to help them out with college education or help grandkids out. Or they may even want to take a special trip with their family. We've seen this a, a number of times. Uh, one family that we've worked with for years, they took all of the kids and grandkids to Disney World here a couple of months ago. And it was so fun to, to hear about it in advance, you know, all the planning and everything that they put into it. But it was also really fun to hear the, the stories and the memories after they got back of what that meant to them. So it's true, you know, they could have left more money to kids or grandkids later on had they waited until they passed away. But really that's priceless. That's priceless to have those memories and to be able to really enjoy that time with them and, and to be able to give them something special that they may not have been able to do on their own financially. So I would really think about estate planning not as just something that deals with death. Think about it as a life thing as well. Think about how can I, um, how can I benefit others while I'm still living and how can I benefit people or organizations when I pass away. Of course, it could be organizations. It could be that you're donating to charity or church or something else on either end of that, either while you're living or when you pass away. Planning for your for your longevity. I'm hearing all kinds of stuff. I'm sure you do too about all the crazy futuristic 
medical procedures that they'll be able to do in the future. Uh, for example, that we're, we'll be able to clone our own organs and replace livers and, you know, whatever it is that normally would kill people or that they'd be on a waiting list for. We've been able to defeat most of the cancers at this point. Hopefully, they'll make some good progress on, on some of the other areas like Alzheimer's that is really, really sad disease, both for the individual and their family. But these are the things that really are being worked on actively right now. And if you just think about where we've come over the last 30, 40 years, as far as what they can do now uh, to be able to keep us not only living, but keep us living with a good quality of life, it's pretty staggering. And that's going to be exponential in the next 30, 40, 50 years, going to be exponential. And I think there will be an awful lot of people in their 90s and hundreds and even beyond that that will be walking around not only alive, but surprised at how good of a quality of life that they have at that point. So I think it's critical to think about longevity. As we looked at the stats before, women do tend to live longer than men, but I think both men and women need to be very, very, uh, I, I won't say concerned, but they need to be looking at that with their planning and not just looking at what their parents experienced in their retirement or their grandparents, but be thinking about the future and what that might look like for them. So even though we, we, tend, we tend to have a hard time sitting down and really dreaming about the future, it's important to think about what does that look like for you? What do you want your life to look like? Who do you want to be able to spend time with and, and be able to help over time and really think about what that experience looks like? And then we can create that in the financial plan. We figure out the funding and really what makes the most sense, not only so you can live today. Of course, you want to live today. You want to do what you want to do on a day-to-day -day basis. But let's make sure that that's going to continue for many, many years. And as long as you're around, that you're able to have the kind of life that you want. So how to make your money work for you. So this is the initial checklist that I came up with. And I, I think this could be helpful for anybody, but specifically for women and especially for, for women who maybe haven't taken an active role in their financial planning in the past is number one, get organized. That's always going to be the most important thing is getting organized to figure out where you are now. Where are you today? Because it's good to dream. Of course, we want to think about the future, but unless we have some idea of where we are now, you really need to know both, right? Just kind of like if you're going to go on a trip, um, again, we're here in Colorado, if we're going to go on a trip to Florida, it's helpful to have a map right? We've got fancy maps now on our phones and garments and things like that, but it's helpful to have a map, but the map really won't do us a whole lot of good unless we know where we are and where we want to go. Um, critical to know where we are, otherwise the map isn't real helpful. So gain organized. Number two, checking or updating beneficiaries. Coupled with the third one, creating or updating your will, really important on both of these. The reason why is that uh, many, many times over the years, people have come into me and they've said, hey, this is great. I got a will. I got all my estate documents done. But then what we find out is once we start asking them some questions, we start asking questions about how their assets are titled and who is named as beneficiary on different assets. And we find out that there's a very different trajectory for the money that they've got than they think, in other words. Uh, the will is only one part of it. Um, sometimes we do need to do a trust. We need to do beneficiary updates. We need to change titles and check on all these things. So all that's very important to understand. Good perspective on that is to think about if something happened to me tomorrow, what would I want to have happen? Really, what would be the, the things I would want to have in place for um, not just your, our money, but our property, our personal possessions, our, uh, you know, our, our wishes as far as what people might do with those possessions or our money. How would we fund things like burial or funeral type expenses? So that's all dealt with in those estate documents. I say that simply because in many cases, and I, when I did this myself, I had a hard time with it too. So it's just being human is that we have a hard time making some of those decisions because we start saying, well, what if this and what if that and what if this happened five years from now? What we have to do, the only way to do this and, um, and actually cause it to be put into place is to think about if something happened to me tomorrow, what would I want now? And put that into place, make those decisions, and then 
guess what? Next week, next month, next year, 10 years, if you make a different decision and say, you know what? No, I, I would not want that kind of funeral arrangements or no, I would not want that person to be making medical decisions, then you can change it. You can change it as often as you want. Uh, checking your credit rating. Pretty important these days, especially because it's not just about the credit rating. It's also making sure that we have a clean credit history. And I say that it's more important now simply because of identity theft is rampant. And not just in this country, but of course, there's all kinds of people in other countries that are trying to hack into our stuff. And it's more and more likely that each of us is going to experience some kind of credit fraud or financial fraud in the future. So very important to look at that. Creditkarma.com is one source for that. We also have a option with all three of the credit agencies to get a free credit report each year. So don't go out and pay some company for your credit report. You get three free credit reports per year if you go to each of the three agencies. Uh, one of those, of course, we all probably know, Equifax. They were the ones in the headlines last year for uh, breaching our security, you know, on our, our data, on our personal data for many, many people that were impacted. Uh, Experian is another one and TransUnion is another. Those are the three big ones. So each of them will give you a free credit report. They're actually legally required to give you a free credit report each year. Pretty important to look at that. I'd say at least once a year, go into that. Make sure that not only do you know your credit rating, but know that you've looked at your credit report and that everything on there is factually correct. And if there wasn't something weird that happened, like, um, you know, somebody applied for a credit card in your name or somehow um, opened a checking account in your name or something like that. Uh, review your cash flow, money coming in, going out. Again, these are the two main financial statements that I would have for everybody would be having a cash flow report that shows all the money coming in, going out and projections into the future. And then number two, a net worth statement, or also called a balance sheet, which would just list your things and your stuff. That would be the assets. And then the liabilities, and that would be what we owe sometimes on that same things and stuff, like real estate, for example. So having that all listed out, and much easier to look at that when it's all in one place, in black and white, or on the screen. We can see that together. We can see what we're worth. Of course, we want to make sure that we've got a positive cash flow. It means we've got more money coming in than going out over time and that we want to increase in net worth over time, meaning that our liabilities are going down, our assets are going up, and that we have a plan that would allow that to happen for a long, long time. Setting financial goals, of course, um, we talked about that before, planning and sticking to a process that really is about financial planning. And some people are okay doing their own financial planning. They are very disciplined and they've done tons and tons of research and educated themselves. I would say that's the vast minority of the country. Uh, most people don't have the time and they probably don't even have the desire to become a financial expert. And even if they did, they probably don't have the emotional financial intelligence, maybe that's the best way to say it, to stick to a process really and to not get triggered by politics and financial crises and market drops and things like that. And oftentimes people do get um, you know, kind of thrown emotionally. That's men and women, by the way. Um, more often than not, uh, you know, men can actually be more impulsive and make some really bad decisions actually uh, by taking on too much risk or uh, you know, bailing on an investment strategy that was well thought out. So very important to stick to a process. And then of course, ask questions, educate yourself, make sure that you know what's going on. Even if you're hiring a financial advisor or financial planner, that doesn't mean just we just check out and aren't involved in the process. It's a collaborative approach, it means that we know where our money is, we know what the plan is. Um, you know, maybe we've, uh, we've, we've hired a, a general, you know, a, a, a commander to, uh, you know, operate the battle plan to come up with the battle plan and, and to uh, to win the war. But that doesn't mean that we can fully check out and aren't involved in the process. We, we do need to know where our money is and understand how it's being managed, uh, you know, what kind of fees we're paying. Basically, the, the process needs to be completely transparent so everybody understands what the objectives are and understanding where we are in the process. So, how can I help as a financial advisor? The way that I can help you really is you can think of me kind of like a money doctor. And 
what I do when I meet with clients is I figure out, um, you know, of course, every time you go into the doctor, they ask you, have you had any changes in your health? Are you on prescription drugs? These sorts of things. So we go back, we figure out that baseline, even if we'd known each other for 20 years, we go back and make sure, is everybody really clear on where we are today? And then our process, as far as figuring out the wealth design, life divine process really is about figuring out from an investment standpoint, what kind of an investor are you? Are you an investor that is very focused and understands the process? Or maybe your experience has been more scattered in the past where you just kind of collected a bunch of stuff and you could have been a good saver, but maybe not a lot of organization behind it. So really our job then is to go through a process. We've got a four-step process, goal identification, getting clear on what we're trying to accomplish, plan development, coming up with a financial plan that has a high likelihood of working out and that we check in on at least annually. Number three is strategy selection. And that's really important to have a strategy. Most people don't even have a financial strategy. They just have a collection of stuff and they're going on luck. So having a very specific reasons for why you own what you own in various accounts and things. So important that we've done some, some significant strategy selection with your input. And then number four, transparent communication, which is key when you're working with any kind of a professional, make sure that there's transparency in that relationship, that everybody understands the, um, the implications of any advice that's given, any cost, and also really what kind of, um, how are things working? What are the inner workings of that strategy to the extent that person wants to know? And we've got all varying degrees. We've got people who, uh, as clients, that tell us, you know what, this is not something that I spend a lot of time on. I don't want to know the stuff in the weeds. I just want to know the big picture and that we're going to be okay. And that's totally fun. We'll, we'll get into what we need to get into. We've got other people who are engineers and they want to know nitty gritty details. And that's fine too. But making sure that there's transparency in that process so everybody knows what to expect. And then the third thing is focused planning, which really means that we are focused on those goals. We're, we've got clear objectives. We know where we are now and that we're doing proactive planning, meaning that we're covering all areas of finance that might impact you. It could be something to do with estate planning, taxes, insurance, employee benefits, social security, Medicare, Medicaid, could be things with your kids, could be helping them with their money, with their college education. So all these different areas are the areas that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis with our clients, as well as when people have decision points that they hit. In other words, we might be going along and we have our plan in place, everything is going smoothly, and then something happens. And it could be a good thing or it could be a bad thing. That something that happens might be an opportunity. For example, somebody might have an opportunity to change jobs or to upgrade their home or to buy a vacation property. Uh, it could be something bad that happens where somebody loses a job or they've got the opportunity to take a retirement package or they could be in a situation where they had, um, you know, maybe a family member that has a need to be um, maybe it's a parent or other family member that might have some kind of a need that they could help with financially. So those are the the, the conversations that I have on a day-to-day -day basis with clients is their money, their stuff, their life, the life decisions that come along the way that get impacted by money. And ultimately what it's about is, is really about creating the quality of life that you want. So someday we all of us will have the, this experience, of course, that there's going to be some day when we look back on our life and we want to be able to look back and not be uh, concerned about our, our stuff and our money because at the end of the day, people we all know this, but it's important to emphasize it again that money doesn't buy happiness and it doesn't matter uh, how much money somebody has accumulated at the end, that's not what they care about. They care about the people that they love. They care about the experiences that they had the opportunities that they had to create memories over the years. That's really why people invest. That's why we're putting money away and why we're doing financial planning, not for just the accumulation of money, because I can tell you from working with a lot of people over the years, and you know this too, because you see the tabloids, you see all the, the celebrities and super rich people who are miserable, that they somehow had the false conception that money was going to buy them happiness. And we know that's not the truth. So very important that we keep that in mind, that that's what it's about. It's about 
the people that we, we care about and also the memories that we get to create. Money plays a role in that clearly, so it's better to have money than not if we can be focused and do things intentionally. So um, let go of the idea that it's too late to start. I love working with young people. I love working with older people, uh, all age groups. Um, and interestingly enough, both ends of the spectrum kind of have some false conceptions. Uh, for people who are young and maybe not earning a lot of money, they say, well, it doesn't matter right now. Um, you know, or I don't have enough money to be able to put away. Not true. Very important to start early and get some good financial habits in place because those financial habits are gonna carry you through the rest of your life. On the other hand, we've had clients that have come to us in their 50s or even 60s that had maybe either not planned well over the years or they went through some kind of a devastating financial event like a divorce or uh, you know, a major illness or something like that, but they still have the opportunity to catch up. They're getting back to work. They've got an income, and they they know they they need to put a lot of money away. I've seen people do some pretty crazy things in short amounts of time to reaccumulate wealth and still have a high quality retirement. It's always better be uh, excuse me. Remember, it's always better to be at the bottom of the ladder you want to climb than the top of the one you don't. Uh, you probably remember that metaphor many years ago, Stephen Covey from The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Uh, one of the concepts in there was making sure that you've got your ladder leaning up against the right wall. In other words, getting really clear on what it is that you're after. What are you trying to accomplish? And it's really important to uh, to stay focused on that, even if that goal may seem out of reach right now. So let me know if there's anything that pops up. Certainly, you can also go to our website at www.keystonefinancial.org. I will take any questions that anybody has right now and um, certainly hang around for a few minutes to be able to cover any financial topics, whether it's directly related to what we've talked about or not. So one of my favorite things that I get to do is teach. And although I'm not a teacher in the traditional sense, like my dad actually was a teacher for a few decades, a high school chemistry teacher, I get the benefit of being able to teach people about money and help them make good decisions. So if anybody has questions, certainly throw them in the uh, question queue or the chat. Also want to point out that we've got our halftime report coming up. We'll do that in webinar format, but if you are around physically here in the Fort Collins Loveland area, we're going to be doing our halftime report at the Agave Room, which is just above the Rio in Old Town, Fort Collins. It's a really cool venue, and I think you're going to enjoy that. Uh, so anybody who can make it, we'd love to have you join us. We're going to be talking about the market and the economy so far for the year, talk about what the experts are saying and what we think is going to happen for the rest of the year so we can get some perspective on that together. Uh, also, we'll be do doing a number of webinars throughout the rest of the year. We also want your feedback. So if you have any topics that you'd like us to cover on our webinars, remember that we record all these. So we will put those out there. If you're listening and you want to pass this on to a family member or a coworker or a friend, please do that because we actually end up having more people that, that listen after the fact than listen live. So please help us get the word out. If there's anything else that we can do for you or your family, I don't see any questions, by the way, so that's fine. If anybody has uh, anything they want to follow up with me on, please reach out to me. Otherwise, have an awesome weekend, and God bless. Take care. Thank you.